Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so I'm pleased to introduce um, Catherine Stenga, who's here to speak to us about elliptic nets with applications to cryptography. All right, thank you very much for inviting me to speak. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I hope you'll um, forgive me for doing this sitting so that I don't have to balance on one leg the whole time. And uh, all right, so. Um, I'm going to be talking about the work I did in my thesis in which I introduced the concept of elliptic nets. Um, but the story really starts with elliptic divisibility sequences, which are recurrent sequences associated to elliptic curves. Um, so I'll start the talk off with the definitions and properties of those. Uh, and then I'll give a definition of elliptic nets as a generalization of the sequences, and I'll try and, gen I'll, uh, try and explain the generalizations and extensions of the properties uh, from the sequences case. Um, elliptic nets are a sort of alternate computational model for the, much of the arithmetic of elliptic curves. So uh, in order to demonstrate what they could be used for, I'm going to give a cryptographic application. So for all the cryptographers in the audience who are looking hopefully at the second half of that, we will get there. Um, and I'll be giving a, an algorithm for computing the Tate pairing. Now, pairings in cryptography um, are a topic of much interest lately, and they're the basis of a number of protocols. Um, but one needs to be able to compute the pairings. And at the moment, the algorithm used is an algorithm by Victor Miller. So I'm going give, to be giving a completely different algorithm, which is of um, the same complexity. And I'll talk more about the comparison as we get towards the end. So learn the technology here. Yay. All right. Um, so elliptic divisibility sequences, this is sort of a heuristic. This is how, they <laughs> how you would catch them in the wild. Um, if you take an elliptic, if you take, sorry, um, an elliptic curve and you take a rational point on the elliptic curve, then choosing a um, usual Weierstrass equation, you can write the uh, rational point in that form and you can pull out a denominator, which will be an integer. So taking the multiples of a particular point and looking at that sequence, you get an associated sequence of integers, which are the denominators. And that's an elliptic divisibility sequence sort of at essence, but um, of course, this isn't actually a very good definition for several reasons. There's some issues with cancellation of primes and things like that, but uh, one maybe obvious reason why it's not really ideal is that <laughs> this isn't even defined. Um, it's only defined up to sign, really. So I'll give an example. So there's um, an elliptic curve and a point. I've just asked the computer to compute the multiples and pulled out the denominators there. And you'll notice I've chosen the signs according to my own devices, which I'll explain later. Um, so technology item number two. All right. So to notice here is that the, uh, the third term divides the sixth term, and the fourth term divides the eighth term. That's the divisibility of divisibility sequences. Um, if n divides n, then the nth term will divide the nth term. <coughs> so here's a better set of definitions for these. So let's start with this one. This is. Um, for, for those of you who may recognize it, this is really just the nth division polynomial, this psi sub n. It's given in terms of the Weierstrass sigma functions, but it has zeros just the n torsion points. So if you fix a curve and you fix a point, then to get the associated sequence, you just take this sequence of elliptic functions and, um, and evaluate at that uh, given rational point. And it's not at all obvious looking at this definition that these are even integers. Um, but we'll see later uh, that they are. Okay, an alternative definition. Um, so you can also generate the exact same sequence that we just saw by taking some initial values, satisfying certain initial conditions, and then just generating the sequence using a recurrence relation. So a couple things to notice from, from this side. It's not, a, first of all, has nothing to do with elliptic curves on this side. Um, and a couple things. One is that in order to calculate a given term of the recurrence, you would have to divide. If you wanted to calculate Wm plus n, you would have to divide by Wm minus n. And also, this recurrence, I mean, there's, there's two variables in there, m and n, so there's actually a lot of um, instances of it. So if you wanted to calculate a particular term in the sequence, you could 
conceivably do so in several different ways. You could take different paths to get there, choosing different instances of the recurrence. So it's not even clear that there exist such things, because given the initial conditions, maybe there is no set of in integers which satisfies that recurrence for all possible instances. But in fact, the, uh, what Morgan Ward showed when he introduced these in 1948 is that uh, these definitions are equivalent. And in fact, you can go back and forth very explicitly. Um, if you have a given curve and a point, then you can figure out what the sequence is just by taking the values. So it's clear how to go from A to B. But in fact, you can also go backwards with explicit polynomial equations telling you what, for instance, the, the Weierstrass um, equation, the coefficients of the Weierstrass equation would be for your curve and what the coordinates of your point would be. And in fact, it's, you can, it's a bijection. So um, every sequence which satisfies the right-hand side here does come from some elliptic curve and point. OK, so since they're associated to elliptic curves, they're going to satisfy certain, um, certain properties reflecting that. So the most obvious one here is that if you have an n-torsion point, remember, these are just the nth division polynomials for, um, or at least they're the, uh, um, another way of saying that is that the, the zeros are the n-torsion points for the nth term. So the nth term will vanish if p is an n-torsion point. But more exciting than that is that this happens mod p as well. If you reduce the curve mod p and you reduce the sequence mod p, then the same thing is true. If p divides some term of the sequence so it reduces to 0, that means that your point reduced to something which had order n. And that's just another way of stating the divisibility condition, which is that the primes appear at even intervals as you walk along z. Um, I should point out these sequences are defined to infinity in both the negative and positive direction. Well, so. Um, so they're indexed by the, the complete integers said. OK, and, and finally, another note, thinking just heuristically even, um, given certain initial conditions to make, make sure things work out, then you can find integral points just by looking for terms of the sequence which are 1. Because if that's the de denominator of your rational point, then it's actually an integer point. Yeah? This sequence test is just by the Fibonacci numbers. Can mm -hmm. we go backwards and get with the curve? Yeah, that's a good question, actually, from this previous definition here, I didn't mention, but we're including the degenerate cases on both sides of this. So on the right-hand side, uh, quote unquote degenerate cases are the integers and the Fibonacci numbers or the Lucas numbers. On the other side, those correspond to singular curves. So if you get a cusp, you'll get the integers. And if you get a node, you'll get the Fibonacci numbers on this side. It's kind of interesting. Or not just Fibonacci numbers, but some Lucas numbers, something like that. OK, so some of the research that's been done um, in terms of uh, about elliptic divisibility sequences, I'll just mention maybe the, the first few of these. So there are applications to the elliptic curve discrete log problem. Uh, Rachel Shipsey, in her thesis, gave a way of, uh, gave a definition of an um, <coughs> elliptic divisibility sequence discrete log problem. And so in certain cases, which are known already to be cryptographically weak, she was able to solve the elliptic curve discrete log problem using the sequences. And I'll actually mention her work a little later when I'm talking about the tape pairing. Um, in terms of that last property that I gave, Mohammed Ayad has published a paper where he manages to find, uh, to give an algorithm for finding integer points, which, um, which applies only, again, in, in certain cases, and applies only to rank one curves, because you, you're just looking at the multiples of one point. And the third one there, I guess, um, relates to the question we just had. Um, elliptic divisibility sequences are, in some sense, for, for number theorists, they're of interest because, in some sense, they're the, the first nonlinear recurrence or the most basic nonlinear recurrence that you might try to study. And so a lot of the research done has had to do with, uh, it comes from the number theory side of things, you know, the appearance of primes and those sorts of things. OK, so a sort of natural question to ask would be, well, this sequence is giving you some information about the cyclic subgroup of the mordell vey group generated by a given point. So can you, can you just do this for a larger subgroup of the mordell vey group, or even the whole thing? Now, the question as stated, the way I have it written here, isn't exactly the right one, because we don't really want um, 
Well, I'll explain, I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. But the, the general idea is, can you get an integer associated to each point so that somehow you're, you're getting um, these numbers that don't, they're not a group now, they have some other sort of properties that's given by the recurrence relation, but reflecting the group structure. Okay, so what do I mean specifically? Well, suppose you take two points which are independent and non-torsion, okay? Then the subgroup they generate can be indexed by Z cross Z. And so then we can just say, well, let's try and associate an integer to each of the um, points in that subgroup, so each linear combination MP plus NQ. Now, I can do this in, in general rank, and uh, I'll point out anywhere where, um, where the results don't uh, work for all N, or for, for all rank of, when I say rank, I mean the, the rank of the Z cross Z there is rank 2. But on the slides, I'll always be showing things in rank 2 because it's just too messy to go uh, writing things in general. Okay. okay, so then the definitions we had before, but now um, for the rank 2 case. Now you can define a doubly elliptic function because now we have to take a curve and two points to generate a net. Um, and then, so choosing those two rational points, then just taking the values, you get a net. Or you can do it by initial conditions and a recurrence relation again. So um, here you need a lot more initial data. Um, but this recurrence relation, as I've written it here, is, is the recurrence relation for all n. This is the recurrence relation in general. And the recurrence relation given before by Morgan Ward is actually just a specific instance of this one. So this applies to the sequences case as well. <coughs> now notice that I'm giving it in terms of vectors in Z cross Z. Okay. So here's an example. Again, this extends to infinity in all directions. I'm just giving the sort of first part of the first quadrant here. So for instance, uh, let's use the laser pointer again. For instance, the 13 here corresponds to um, 3p plus 2q. Okay. So this is actually the, um, the same curve and point p that I had in my first example, but now I've chosen another point q. And so if you go along the x-axis there, this is just the elliptic divisibility sequence that we saw associated to p. If you go up this, you'll see the elliptic divisibility sequence associated to the point q. And in fact, any line through the origin, you get an elliptic divisibility sequence. This would be the one associated to P plus Q. <coughs> um, you can also take lines that don't go through the origin and look at those integer sequences. They satisfy recurrences as well and have been studied independently. They're often referred to as translated elliptic divisibility sequences, and they were studied by Christine Swart and uh, Alf van der Porten. Um, and they're an instance of SOMOS sequences. So elliptic divisibility sequences and translated elliptic divisibility sequences are instances of SOMOS sequences. Um, okay, so what of the divisibility? Um, when I first was uh, doing this, I was calling them elliptic divisibility nets because they do have an appropriate property, but, um, but it was just too cumbersome to say all the time. So what of the divisibility? Well, in the one-dimensional case, the divisibility property was really that the primes appeared at even intervals. So let's look at all the even numbers in here, all the numbers divisible by 2, and they appear in an even, uh, in, a, in a nice sub-lattice of Z cross Z. So this is the divisibility concept um, here. Okay, so, um, so I show that the definitions that we have there are equivalent and moreover you can go back and forth explicitly, and you have really sort of n plus two pieces of data that determine a net. Um, the one direction is, is always fairly easy to go from the curve to the net, but to go backwards, it's sometimes a big pain. So those are the polynomials which determine the Weierstrass equation associated to a given net where I've chosen certain initial conditions up top. Okay, so uh, I'm, for proofs of things, I'm just going to give a couple of notes and feel free to ask me more questions. But um, to show, for the one direction, you simply have to show that these 
um, n-fold elliptic functions satisfy the recurrence, and that's a fairly straightforward uh, thing. But then to go backwards, what you can do is you can figure out what curve and point you should have by looking at the axes, where you know that those are just elliptic divisibility sequences. And then from the rank 1 case, you can figure out what curve and point um, it's supposed to be. And then you have to, of course, prove that if you, if you do that, then you get and then you come back again, you get the same net you started with, so that the axes actually determine what the net is. Um, so there's a lot of sort of technical stuff using the recurrence relation in here. And it's actually sort of an interesting question to um, try and explore the space of recurrences, because it's quite complicated. All right, about the integrality. In the one-dimensional case, it's fairly simple. If you start with integers and w2 divides w4, then you can prove with a cute little induction that it's integral. Um, but it gets rapidly more difficult. And <coughs> I, you know, there's, there's some real reason why these things take integer values. Or else, maybe they stop taking integer values for some large n. Um, both of those would be interesting questions. But at the moment, um, just using complicated, messy, inductive uh, proofs by controlling the division going on and picking the recurrence relations appropriately, I can prove that they take integer values given appropriate initial conditions um, up to dimension or rank 6. So that's a frustrating hole in what I can do at the moment. Um, and as I said, you just have to sort of control the visibility. OK. Um, but what's really interesting I think, is reducing mod p. So this is probably the most important, uh, important theorem, which is that and I've tried to write it in some way that, uh, <laughs> that explains what I'm doing. But really what I'm saying is just what we said before, which is that if you have a curve and some points, and you take the elliptic net associated to that, and you look at it mod p, that's really, in, in some sense, appropriately reflecting the reduced curve mod p and the points that you've reduced mod p on that curve. And um, as an example here, now I've highlighted the terms which are divisible by 5 on the same curve. So let's reduce mod p. Or, sorry, reduce mod 5. And that's what we get. So um, there's so something sort of a subtlety but very important going on right, right now which is that the elliptic net is not a function of the points in the subgroup of the Mordell-Vey group that I'm talking about. Because if it were, then, let me use the pointer here. If it were, then this parallelogram here should just repeat. Because we've shown that, see, 3p plus q is 0. So 3p plus q plus another p should be the same as just p. Right? If it were actually a function of the points, but it's not. It's a function of the formal linear combinations of the points, even, even when the points are um, torsion or dependent somehow. Okay. So going, going back to those original slides when I said it was um, independent and non-torsion, you can actually do it in general. It's just you have to be aware of the fact it's not really a function. But we don't really want just a function of the, the group itself. It's a function of z cross z. Okay. So, um, so the zeros indicate where the, the point goes to the point at infinity, but these other numbers are a little bit mysterious. They don't seem to repeat parallelogram to parallelogram. And in fact, um, we'll get into that in more detail in a second. Okay. Um, so the proof of the reduction theorem, um, what to say about that? Um, you really, it's really a question of looking at the, instead of this n-fold product of elliptic curves, you want to look at it as a, as a scheme over spec z, and you want to know that um, if you extend these elliptic functions, then over uh, the special fibers, they'll behave properly and, and whatnot. In some sense, what I'm saying is, if you think of them as polynomials, like the division polynomials, then the, they shouldn't have any denominators, or they should have integer coefficients without any GCD. Um, so in order to do that, you can, you can develop enough of the theory of how these nets behave under endomorphisms of the unfold product of the curve. And then that allows you to do a cute trick to reduce to the rank 1 case. 
and it does rely on the integrality theorem. Um, so that means I can only do it up to n equals 6. So here's the statement of the divisibility property, which is a consequence, um, which is just that if you look for the terms in your net, which are divisible by p, those will appear as a sublattice. Okay. I'll let you read this slide for one second while I take a drink. So this is for the sequences case. So it doesn't, your elliptic divisibility sequence when you reduce mod p won't actually have period r. It'll have period some multiple of r. And if you know the first r terms, okay, where r is, uh, I forgot to mention, r is called usually called the rank of apparition here. It's where the, uh, um, it's the order of the point or um, the first zero which appears mod p. Okay. So if you know the first r terms of your sequence, then you can determine the next block according to this periodicity relation here. And then you can determine the block after that and so on. And because this a and b um, have some order, you'll eventually get back to having the same block that you had in the first place. So it will have some, your sequence will have some period which is a multiple of r. Okay, and there's formulae for the a and b which you can calculate explicitly. Now this was shown by Morgan Ward. All right, I'm going to restate it in a form which is generalizable because if you try to generalize this statement, you get a page full of um, ugly formulas again. <laughs> so let's say you take an elliptic divisibility sequence and you're looking at it over a finite field so that the rth term vanishes. Then there's some alpha, which is not necessarily in that finite field, but whose rth power is, so that an appropriate scaling of the elliptic divisibility sequence will actually have period exactly r. And you can go back to the other statement of this periodicity um, according to the formulas there for a and b. So this isn't as intuitive here. I really sort of think of it this way, but, uh, but this is a statement which we can generalize for nets. So supposing now that you have two vectors giving the vanishing mod p, um, then taking the GCD of those coordinates, interestingly, um, there's some alpha whose d power is in that finite field, and then you can appropriately scale the elliptic net in order to get it periodic exactly with respect to that lattice. And again, this um, unfortunately is restricted to n less than or equal to 6 at the moment, although I don't have any reason to think it's not true in general, of course. <laughs> Yep. Did you run numerical experiments to see whether it, it seems to hold for 7 or 8? Um, no, I haven't run any, gi any gigantic nets like that just because I'm not quite sure how to visualize the data or deal with it. <laughs> but, uh, and because I haven't really had any use for it at the moment. But, um, but I should. I don't know. Um, okay, so the proof for periodicity. Um, oh, yeah, the... So this conditions here that it vanishes at those points, that tells you something about those points, because remember then um, they must be on the they must be on the zero part of the, the divisor. So um, so knowing that you can then just sort of plug that into the elliptic functions. And this is what you do a lot of the time now that we have this reduction theorem, is you can prove something uh, in the case of curves over the complex numbers using the elliptic function theory, and then just reduce mod p and it'll still hold over finite fields. Okay. And there's a lot more of these sort of periodicity results. Um, Christine Swart in her thesis gives, uh, well, her thesis is, is just tons and tons of these results for elliptic divisibility sequences um, and also for translated elliptic divisibility sequences. And so you can do this in general. Um, everything generalizes and, um, and you get all kinds of information. So for instance, you can look at what's the periodicity mod powers of a prime. And how does that relate to the periodicity mod, the prime, and stuff like that? Okay. Ah, so now on to the, uh, the cryptography. So, um, so okay, so that's, that's the sort of basic information about the elliptic nets. I just wanted to tell you, just going back for a second, to keep this slide in mind. All right, we'll come back to why this has to do with tape pairing. Okay, 
the tape pairing. So this is just a, uh, a pairing on points on an elliptic curve. You actually have to choose a positive integer, and take, uh, call it m, and then restrict one of the points has to be an m torsion point. And we consider the other point as, uh, as living e mod m e. So um, given that your point p is an m torsion point, you will always have um, this divisor being principal, so you can take the associated function fp. And for the point q, you can take a divisor which is linearly equivalent to d minus 0, but with disjoint support from the divisor of fp. And then you can just use this formula. And you get a pairing. Um, it's a bilinear pairing. It's non-degenerate. Um, it is not symmetric, <laughs> which <laughs> took me a while to figure out because Joe told me it was symmetric when he first told me what it was. <laughs> so um, pairings, the Tate pairing and the Vey pairing in particular, are of interest to cryptography because there's a number of protocols based on, on, uh, on having this extra s thing you can do with your, your curve. So Tate pairing actually comes from the elliptic nets, it turns out. So this is basically the same setup we had before over here, except I'm taking the point s, just it's some other point, which is not 0 or minus q. And then take some elliptic net such that at the vectors s, p, and q, it's associated to the points s, p, and q. Okay. Then the Tate pairing can be calculated using this formula right here. So just a note that um, in order to prove this, what you really do is you say that the net you choose doesn't matter. So you show that there's a notion of, of equivalence of nets, which um, that formula is invariant under. And then that means that you can choose an appropriate net so that the quotient of functions is exactly what you want, and you can just prove it directly at that point. All right, and because we have this freedom of choosing um, an appropriate net, we can pick... Um, we can pick some appropriate nets to make the calculations fairly simple. So in particular, if you want to pair a point with itself, you might as well just choose the one-dimensional case because it's easy to deal with. And then this formula will look like this. And that's what I want you to notice because this is exactly the formula for A in the periodicity slide, which I'm not sure I'll back all the way back up there. but. Um, and in the two-dimensional case, you can, of course, choose two points and take the net generated by those two points, P and Q, and some appropriate um, quotient there will give you the tape pairing. So um, I actually wanted to point out one thing, which I didn't make a slide for, so I'm just going to write something up on the board here, which is that... Yeah, wait a second. All right. Um... So your periodicity relation looks something like this. Okay. So um, all right. So if we wanted to isolate A, we can just do this. This is sort of where the formula comes from in the one-dimensional case. Do this with n, and then do it with n plus 1. And I probably got this upside down. We're going to get a to the n b over a to the n plus 1 b. OK, so I got the inverse of a. Uh, <laughs> I did this last time I was doing this, too. <laughs> OK. Um, so what I wanted to point out is that um, this gives you a way of seeing if these points Suppose you have the data Wn and Wn plus 1. So you have those terms. And suppose you also have the terms Wn plus r and Wn plus 1 plus r. So you have two little chunks of your divisibility sequence. Remember, I'm just doing this for the sequence case at the moment here. You have two little chunks of your divisibility sequence. Then um, you can tell if they're a distance r apart by, um, actually, wait a second. Let me assume I have three pieces here. Sorry. N plus 1 plus 2, sorry, plus R. Okay, so suppose I have the three 
chunks there. You can tell if they're a distance r apart by simply taking these, the first two and checking that what you get is the same as when you take the second pairs and see if you get the same thing. Because if you're a distance r apart, then you get this nice divisibility relation. If you're not a distance r apart, you're just going to get some other nonsense. Um, so this is sort of the sense in which the, the curves can be used as an alternate way of computing things. Um, so for instance, if you wanted to know if you have a point which is period r, then you could use this method of doing it the same way that you would normally. Yeah? Yeah, we're doing a date pairing. <coughs> normally our arithmetic is in a finite field, so mm -hmm. how does all this divisibility apply? Well, what I mean is if, you, if you're looking at curves over q, for instance, and you reduce mod p, then you're working over the finite field fp. And I can actually do all these things I should have said earlier for any number field. So you can reduce mod any prime in a number field. Okay? And then you can work over the, the finite field that you get. But I, I keep, for the slides, I keep putting q and p because um, it's a little clearer to look at. Um, okay, so what I was saying here is just so the simple question of uh, checking whether um, finding the order of your point, for instance. I mean, short of multiplying and checking as you go up when it hits zero, right? You might try to do some silly algorithm where you jump around and see if you get some collisions to check, something like you would for if you're trying to solve the elliptic curve discrete log problem. But you do the same thing with the nets, okay? So it's just a sort of alternate computation, computational model. Okay. I don't know if that was um, part missing from my talk there. So, okay. Um, so to actually calculate the Tate pairing, going back to the Tate pairing now, um, if we have these formulas like this, what you need to do to calculate it is somehow or other you have to start with the initial conditions because your curve and points tell you the initial conditions for the net. So you start with that data and you need to somehow calculate out to the point M, uh, to a distance M from the origin. So you can do this using a double and add formula. So this is based on an algorithm by Rachel Shipsey. This is what she was doing in her thesis. She gave a, a double and add <coughs> algorithm using blocks of the sequence to calculate um, out in, to a distance m in log m time. So using the second formula, sorry for flipping the slides back and forth a couple of times, but using the second formula at the bottom here, you can see that there's sort of two types of terms. There's the ones that include a q and the ones that don't. Okay, so in the block that I'm taking, these are from the sequence that don't include the Q. It's kind of like the x-axis in the picture I had before. And these are from the second row up here that include one Q. So then taking this, this whole block, it gives enough information to calculate a whole block centered at 2K. Remember, the recurrence relation is actually fairly complicated. It has lots of terms in it. So you can't just go term to term. You're going to need to take a whole bunch of uh, a whole block of terms in order to be able to calculate the next one. And this is sort of the best I could come up with, but of course, um, you know, perhaps it's possible to do uh, a computer search of the recurrent space to come up with something much more efficient. But the idea is to choose some appropriate block, and then you can jump to a block at 2k or 2k plus 1, and then you can use a double and add algorithm to, to get out to distance m. I have a question. So mm -hmm. Is uh, Miller's algorithm for the date pairing, is that randomized? Um, in the k equals 1 case, I'll, I'll answer that question in a second. How's that? Um, Miller's algorithm uh, is also a double and add algorithm like this, okay? except he's sort of doing calculations which have to do with the, you know, doubling the point on the curve as you go. But it also breaks down into double and double add. Okay. Um, so then, just to sum up, the, the way you would calculate it is you take the net and the points, uh, sorry, the curve and the points, calculate the associated net, and then use the double and add algorithm to get out to the distance you need and just plug that into the formula. Okay, so I'll answer your question with respect to this slide. Um, usually in cryptographic applications, um, what you're really doing is you're working with a curve um, which is defined over fq, but then you take the smallest k such that m divides q to the k minus 1. And then your tape pairing, th this is sort of to make your tape pairing sufficiently interesting. <laughs> your tape pairing, then the group that it takes values in will be as big as it can be. And um, 
and for cryptographic applications, you usually choose the point P to live in the smaller field and Q to live up in the larger one. And this is because if you let P live in the smaller one um, computationally, um, in Miller's algorithm, that saves you a lot of work because working in the smaller field is easy and in fact you can sort of ignore all the work you do in the smaller field, it turns out. Um, but you need, for security, you need to actually be working enough Q to the K, so you take Q up there. Um, and for embedding degree one in Miller's algorithm, then you, then you have to choose a, an extra point, and I guess you can do that randomly. In, in higher embedding degree, I think there's a way of, of avoiding doing that because of this. Okay. So for cryptographic cases, you can think of Miller's algorithm as also being deterministic. Um, yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I do. <laughs> well, it, yeah, it is. It is. But you have a lot of choices. I mean, you could choose from all these different nets. And so, you know, maybe there's some reason to do that, but I don't think so. Um, okay, and... Uh, a note about the embedding degree is that for security, you want your curve to have um, something like 2 to the 160 elements or something like that. Um, but you don't want to be able to reduce to the um, discrete log problem on uh, a finite field, which is too small because then that wouldn't be safe. So the embedding degree, um, the embedding degree has to be relatively large so that um, so that you don't have to get a curve which is really, really big just in order to guarantee the, uh, the security. So usually for cryptographic applications, the embedding degree um, is somewhere between like 6 and 10 or something would be ideal. Okay. So uh, for in terms of looking at the efficiency, um, I've just denoted squarings and multiplications in the lower field as S and M and SK and MK for ones that you have to do in larger uh, larger field. And both Miller's and the net algorithm are double or, uh, or double and add algorithms, so I've just broken it down by the steps double and double add. And these are the numbers, okay, where did I get these numbers? Well, Miller's, um, these are the numbers suggested by Michael Scott as a, an efficient implementation. There are so many optimizations and implementations with different, you know, um, different conditions in which they work and whatnot, so I just tried to pick something representative of what was fairly good. Um, and the net algorithm there, that's just basically the way I've presented it here with some really simple optimizations. I could do some much more complicated optimizations, but they weren't even worth trying to explain for the amount of uh, optimization that you get out of them. So this is, this is just the basic, um, the, the basic complexity. Um, and then I've just, for particular embedding degrees ranging from 2 to 12 there, I've given examples of, of how many steps it would take. Um, this has actually been implemented, and I wrote down <coughs> the names because I can't. So this is this um, algorithm for the tape pairing has been implemented by uh, Ben Lin, who's a student of Dan Benet in the public uh, the pairing-based cryptography library. Um, so he just wrote to me to tell me he'd done that recently, and he tested it for embedding degree two and said it was indeed about twice as slow. Um, and he suggests that maybe some windowing um, could uh, optimize it or things like that. So I haven't, um, I haven't tried, you know, looking into those optimizations yet. Um, also, Michael Scott and his student Augusto Dun de Vigli, I'm not sure I said that correctly, um, they also implemented it and um, sent me the, the code and, and whatnot. They implemented another optimization based on an idea of, of twisting the curve so that your uh, point Q doesn't have to be in quite such a large field. Um, and he said, <laughs> I quote, it's only a little slower. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not exactly sure what that means. Um, ben Lin also mentioned that he thinks for embedding degree k equals 1, where a lot of these optimizations for Miller's algorithm don't really apply, and you have to sort of do more work, that maybe there it would be more, more efficient. So, um, so I, I don't know. <laughs> um, I, I hope that, you know, if it's really, uh, you know, given a chance to try and optimize this and stuff, I hope that the efficiency could improve quite a bit, but that's where it stands. Okay, um, so that's it for the cryptography, and I'm just going to mention a couple possible other directions to head with the research. Um, 
One is, is it possible to do this for Jacobians of higher genus curves? This is something that I've been keeping in the back of my mind for, for ages as I've been working on this. And uh, there's some really intriguing connections and stuff. People have tried to do this with elliptic divisibility sequences in different ways. And uh, if it could, I gather for genus 2 in particular, it would probably have um, cryptographic applications because the computations there are much more complicated than on an elliptic curve. Um, also, can you use the periodicity relations to find integer points, just as um, Mohammed Ayad does? But this time, you could do it for curves of higher rank, because you've got the nets instead of just the sequences. Um, also, other computational applications. Um, this, it contains the information of what the order of the point is, reduced mod p. So it contains the information, in some sense, of, of the size of your curve over, over finite fields. And so maybe there's some way of, like, using that information. You know, it's, it's there in the periodicity relation, and maybe you can somehow um, harness that. But that's a very open, vague question. And of course, are there other cryptographic applications of the Tate pairing relationship, or just of using them computationally? So I'll just leave you with some references. Morgan Ward's original paper is called A Memoir on Elliptic Divisibility Sequences. Uh, Christine Swart's thesis, which I mentioned, um, is called Elliptic Curves and Related Sequences. We've got tons of information in there. And if you want an overview of the literature associated to elliptic divisibility sequences, uh, there's a whole chapter in recurrent sequences by Everest, Vanderport, and Sparlinski and Ward, and that uh, that's covers all the different aspects of, of what you might study with, with that. And um, there are now three implementations of, of the algorithm available. One is in the pairing-based cryptography library there. Another is a, a little Paris script I wrote on my web page originally. And, uh, and also, I'm sure Michael Scott would be willing to share the, the implementation that, that he did. So there you go. Yes. Um, the vape pairing can be computed as two tape pairings. So you could just do that, I suppose. Um, well, let's see. You would have to, because it's PQ and QP, you would have to go out the net in one direction and another direction. Um, I'm not sure if there's some way, maybe if you chose um, if you cleverly chose your net, you would be able to walk in the same direction to get both pieces of information. That's a good idea. I haven't thought about whether that's possible. Yeah? Those ID systems uh, always, always go to a, to a, to a higher, uh, to F, from FP to F, power of P. I thought they stayed with FP and maybe with a, what do you call it, a twist of it. Yeah, I'm, I don't know very much about um, using twists in that case, but it allows you to not work in the full embedding degree, but somewhere a little bit lower. Um, but I probably there's a cryptographer in the room who would be able to answer that better than I could. <laughs> <laughs> it's mostly been implemented for like characteristic two and three, or they can work on super singular ones where the embedding degree is like six, uh -huh. and so they usually have there's a couple of there's only a few choices for different curves and, and embedding. There. But you could, you can do it more generally, where you can work on ordinary curves. But some of the wave pairing stays in the, in the same curve; doesn't go to extend. Doesn't have to go to extend. But maybe I got it wrong. Yeah. I was going to ask about mm -hmm. the generalizations of genus two. So, uh, kind of, what would you hope for there? Would you, you'd hope to find kind of points on the Jacobian that would. Um, whose multiples like that would correspond to the values of uh, Yeah, well, I guess, um, yeah, it's hard, it's hard to know which direction that generalization would go. Um, one way of looking at this periodicity relation is that, um, well, I guess I don't really need to write this down, I can just say it, but um, one way of looking at the periodicity relation is that the extra information you have, because it's not really a function just of the points, so you're m sort of more information than the group. What's actually going on there is it's it's uh, it's giving the it's giving the extra information that you would get if you took an extension of the curve by the multiplicative group. So if you took a generalized Jacobian instead of just the elliptic curve. So it's possible um, that for genus two Jacobians again you would just get something which has this sort of periodicity relation like this that's um, that's sort of reflecting the generalized Jacobian. Um, 
for that Jacobian. But I don't, I don't know if it would necessarily satisfy a recurrence relation still. Another way of generalizing it would be to see whether there's some recurrence that would work for that case. And maybe, maybe those wouldn't even coincide. So maybe it wouldn't have the same behavior in that case. It's very hard to say. <laughs>